I'm Calgary from Northwestern and now from here. And he's going to talk about event orientations and the content major convention. So I'm following Pierre in giving a talk with the same title that I gave uh, the Princeton Number Theory last year, but I promise you it's a different talk. Okay. So let X over Q be a smooth proper variety. Or if you want, think of X as a motive. Then associated to X, you can consider various cohomology groups. In particular, having chosen the prime P, you can consider the tau cohomology with coefficients in QP. And you could also consider the Durham cohomology of X. Okay. So these should both essentially compute the same thing, which is the Betty cohomology of the complex points. On the other hand, they have different structures. For example, on the left-hand side, there's an action of the Galois group. And on the right-hand side, for example, there's a, a, a Hodge filtration. So Grothendieck asked, well, given such a representation, how can you recover the structure of the Durham cohomology since essentially they should be the same? And Fontaine came up with the answer, namely, if V is a finite QP vector space, with an action of the local Galois group. Then, uh, then there's a functor, diorama V, which is defined in some way, in particular just uh, given by tensing your representation with one of Fontaine's ring of periods, and then taking invariance in the Galois group. And then what one has is that, well, this is going to be a finite dimensional representation of a QP, QP vector space with a filtration. And uh, you have the following definition. So V is Durham if the dimension of d to ram v is equal to the dimension of v. And moreover, the conjecture that if uh, v is the etal cohomology, then you can consider the representation here restricted this group. You can apply this functor. And then the claim, or the conjecture is, that you should actually, that this v should actually be to ram, and that you should actually recover. Uh, the Durham cohomology along with the, the Hodge filtration. So this conjecture is, uh, I guess, C Durham, and uh, there are other related conjectures that have now all been proved uh, by various people uh, who I don't want to name all, but I guess now Nizio has a nice, maybe the best proof, as they say. Okay. All right. So one has the following uh, story then. So if V is, in fact, now we know, even just a subquotient of this cohomology group, QP, so then we know that 1, V is Durham. So when considered as a representation of the local group, and 2, uh, the action of the Galois group, which I'll now abbreviate as GQ, uh, is unramified outside finitely many primes. Finitely many primes. So these two conditions one defines as being 
geometric. So we'll call a representation of GQ geometric if it satisfies one or two. And the difficult theorem is that if V is a subquotient, then it is geometric. And so Fontaine Mesa conjectured the converse to this. So this is a conjecture, is that if V is geometric, then V actually does come from a motive or some, some sort of geometry. So then V is motivic, which you can think of as just being exactly a subquotient of Hn x q bar qp uh, up to twist the sum x. Uh, geometric, irreducible and geometric, thank you. Well, I mean, yes, I mean, I didn't say x was smooth here, so you might make that conjecture too, but you didn't. Uh, put your name here, so I'll put this word here. Okay. So one could ask e even slightly more. I mean, if you think you could imagine motivic means actually comes from a motive, which is a, is a I'm not sure if you conje literally conjectured that, but that's sort of, that, that's somehow Fontaine Mesa plus epsilon, where epsilon, I guess, is the Tate conjecture. Is the, gro <laughs> Sorry, the grosnick Sayer conjecture plus the Tate conjecture is, is the epsilon. OK. OK. But they made a, all right. So having said this, of course, these are representations of of QP representations, but of course you can replace QP by a finite extension uh, E of QP and ask the same question to vector spaces over E. So now I'm going to imagine V is finite dimensional over E, where E QP is finite. Okay. So if the dimension of V is equal to 1, then class field theory, in fact, tells you that uh, the answer is yes, that, it, that, it's, that the Ponte Mesa conjecture is correct. If the dimension of V is 2, then in fact, Fontaine and Mesa made a much more precise conjecture, which is the following. So in order to state it, I need to make the following remark. The condition on being Durham was exactly the one that allowed you to secretly recover uh, the Durham cohomology, and in particular, recover the Hodge filtration. And so from the Hodge filtration, you should expect to recover the Hodge numbers. And so in particular, from V, you can associate a sequence of integers, the Hodge Tate weights, that are in some sense the playing the role of, of these Hodge Tate numbers. So you mentioned V2, there are two cases. So case one, so in two dimensions, there will be a pair of Hodge Tate weights. So there'll be dim V Hodge Tate weights. These are just dim V integers in Z. So case one, is that uh, the Hodge Tate weights are equal. And then it's, the conjecture says that up to twist, GQ uh, has finite image in or V is GL2E. OK. And once you have a representation of finite image, you can then add on the Arden conjecture that says that it should be modular, or automorphic, I should say. Case two is the Hodge Tate weights are uh, distinct, and then up to twist. Uh, GQ, or the representation, acts as a representation rho f, where f is a classical 
modulo 4. Okay. So, quite a lot about this is known, starting from the work of Wiles, but uh, one particular theorem that I is quite close to saying this, so this is a theorem of Kisson, but uh, this is also, this is somehow dependent, certainly on the work of Carl Mez and papers of Emerton, and these papers all rely on each other in some circular way. <laughs> <laughs> and, Ka and Carre and Winton Berger, uh, which is the following. So all these, this theorem is, is well, there are implications for this in case one, but as far as for case two. So let's assume we're in case two. So case two is proved under the following hypotheses. Well, one, well, this V gives rise to a representation of the Galois group into the automorphism group, which is GL2E, but in fact, there exists a lattice that's Galois stable, so it actually lands inside GL2OE after conjugation. And then you can reduce this representation mod P and get a representation rho bar. So the sum assumption on rho bar, namely that rho bar restricted to the Galois group of Q over QZ to P is absolutely irreducible. And P is at least 3. Uh, condition two is a slightly annoying condition, which is that if you restrict to the local Galois group, so QP over Q, QP bar over QP, then it's not a twist of the following representation, which is the cyclotomic character mod P, 0, 1, stop. Well, epsilon from GQ to ZP bar is the cyclotomic character. Yeah, uh, okay. That's the theorem of Emerton, but I'm talking about the theorem of Kisson. Which, yes. And three, the condition that rho is odd, in other words, that the determinant of rho on complex conjugation, well, this will be an element of order two. Uh, so diagonalized will be plus or minus one, so it's the determinant will be plus or minus one. And the condition is the determinant is equal to minus one. Uh, and then, the, then uh, rho is modular. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So what I want to talk about today is the following theorem, uh, which looks a, a, a quite a bit like this. So now let me give condition one. Well, condition one is actually going to be worse than this condition one. So it's actually going to be that rho bar uh, has image containing SL2 FP, and P is at least 7. OK. Now, this can certainly be improved probably to something like p is bigger than 3 and rho bar is not uh, dihedral, but that's just using a preprint that, of Jack Thorne that was only, <laughs> only a few days old, so I don't want to change this until I read that. Condition 2 is exactly the same condition that occurs in this theorem, which is that rho bar uh, restricted to the local Galois group is not a twist of epsilon star 0, 1. And here I, I do need the star, which is why pedagogically I don't want to change the theorem there. And 3, uh, well, the point is that there is no 3. So then rho is modular. Yeah, again in case two, yes. 
Ah, OK. So I guess when Colmez talked about the Fontaine Mesa conjecture last a week ago, he added the assumption that rho was odd, but that Fontaine Mesa don't make this assumption. And so the question is, why don't you need to make this assumption? Why is it the case that uh, this is true? I mean, of course, if you take the representation associated to a, so this is equal to rho f, it's not so hard to see that if you take a modular form, that rho f is odd. So in fact, one deduces from this case that rho bar, that rho is odd. But of course, you don't have this a priori. So the very simple reason why you should expect rho bar to be odd. So let's go back and imagine uh, we started with the motive, again, over Q, of Frank 2. Then the fact that this has distinct hodge tate weights is telling us something like uh, Uh, if we look just at the, the Hodge decomposition theorem, this is equal to something like Hn0 plus H0n, and these are both one-dimensional. So after twist, we have something like this, and the point is that this n is not equal to zero. But you know how complex conjugation acts on the Hodge decomposition? It takes HPQ to HQP. So you know complex conjugation acts here by 0, 1, 1, 0. And, and this has determinant equals minus 1. And if you believe, well, I mean, it depends exactly what you're starting with. But the action of complex conjugation on the, the Hodge decomposition should be the same as the action of complex conjugation on the Atal cohomology. So this computation shows that whenever there's nothing of, of there's no HKK, that the action of complex conjugation should always have trace zero. In particular, if it's just two-dimensional, it should always have determinant minus one. So that's sort of morally why it, it doesn't exist. But that's, of course, uh, not an argument. I mean, I, it, I, as it's turned out, it seems easier to prove this strengthened version of the fontaine mesa conjecture. We actually prove something's automorphic rather than just merely prove it's uh, geometric. OK. All right. So how does one prove a modularity, uh, modularity theorem? Well, first, you start with rho bar, and you prove rho bar is modular. And then you prove that every lift of a modular representation is modular. And that's a very successful uh, strategy. But even the first step, one is doomed, of course, because if you take rho bar and p is at least 3, then if rho is even, then rho bar, you'll certainly be able to tell that complex conjugation will have determinant 1. And so in particular, rho bar is never modular. And it's not as if that representations of rho bar don't exist. It's not so hard to write down representations from the Galois group of Q to GLP, a GL2 FP, that are even. I mean, at least for small p. So there certainly exist representations rho bar of this form. Somehow the claim is that there's no lift that will actually be Dirac. All right. So this brief idea sketch will be something I also talked about last time, but it probably bears repeating. So the strategy is to take a representation and to somehow manipulate it in some way into a situation where one might expect it should be modular or where one can apply these methods. So the most obvious strategy is to take k on q to be imaginary quadratic field. And then if I take my representation that I want to prove is modular, GL2e, I can take the restriction to this imaginary quadratic field. And now, Complex conjugation has disappeared, so I no longer have a problem. It's, it's as odd as anything else. So this is, is odd in some trivial sense. But there's a problem which you can essentially describe as follows. If you take the group GL2 of a k, uh, well, this group doesn't, the real points don't have discrete series, and therefore the whole Taylor Wiles method just doesn't work at all. 
So Taylor Wilde's method fails. Okay. So that's strategy one. Strategy two, well, we can recognize a special property of our representation V. We know that V, because it's two-dimensional, it is self-dual up to twist. On the other hand, it's certainly isomorphic to its conjugate. Well, we think of complex conjugation just because it's defined over Q. So we have some isomorphism between the conjugate and uh, the dual up to twist. So rho is conjugate self-dual. And if you've heard talks by uh, a bunch of people in the audience, you'll know that this is somehow exactly the type of representation that comes up when one's studying automorphic forms or regular algebraic cuspidal automorphic forms for unitary groups. And so this is sort of a more promising looking condition because it exactly is the type of shape that Gower representations, which are associated to groups with discrete series, look like. Except, even though we rep we're still thinking about this representation over this imaginary quadratic field, there's still a secret sign. And this sign is still wrong. So by sign, I mean it's still possible to tell that this representation is somehow even. Okay. And this is related, uh, in some sense, to the issue of two-dimensional representations and the difference between symplectic and orthogonal representations and various signs of pairing. So still, uh, this unitary group, or this twisted unitary group, C is a sign in some way. Which is perhaps not so surprising, because if you think about unitary groups, I mean, something like U2, that's basically not really any different from SL2. So somehow we shouldn't be able to uh, escape in this way. Okay. So in fact, it turns out this issue with signs and deciding between orthogonal and symplectic pairings is only an issue in even dimensions. If you take an odd dimensional uh, representation that's self-dual up to twist, then essentially it has to be an orthogonal pairing, I mean, if it's irreducible, just because there aren't symplectic uh, pairings, uh, non-degenerate symplectic pairings in odd dimension. So in fact, the real strategy is to take V and replace it by W, which is the symmetric square. So one immediately gets that W uh, is, well, is self-dual up to twist. That W is Durham. And that W has distinct hodge tate weights. OK. So again, it's still a slightly worrying situation because it's still even. But here again, we can take the representation rho w and restrict to imaginary quadratic field GL3e. Maybe I'll even say O of e. And now we'll have an irreducible representation. Uh, well, if it's not irreducible, then v was induced from a character, in which case the theorem is easy. But we have an irreducible representation, which is conjugate self-dual up to twist. It is Durham. It does have distinct hodge tate weights. And it is odd in the sense that's going to be required by the fact that it comes from an automorphic form. So here we're in a situation where the methods of Taylor Wiles can apply. Okay. So let's just imagine that one could replace the theorem of Kisson uh, for GL2 by an equivalent condition for unitary groups and three variables. So say give yourself Sayers conjecture and all modularity lifting theorems. Then using that, we could deduce that this was modular for GL3. Then, because the Gower representation is, is invariant, we could deduce it was modular for GL3 over Q. And then we could recognize, we can re recognize symmetric squares. So you could actually go back and deduce that the original representation rho was modular, and you would be done. And you would deduce somehow the fact that rho was odd from the fact that rho was modular. 
OK. Well, of course, we can't really do this because we can't prove Sears conjecture for U3. But in fact, we don't need to. In fact, all we need to show need only show that rho w is potentially modular. That is, there exists uh, f over q, a cm field, such that there's a pi, which is a regular algebraic, essentially self, uh, regular cuspidal self dual cohomological for GL3 over f that's associated to rho w. Okay. And if that was true, well, what you end up showing when you try to do this backwards is you don't show that rho is modular, but you show that rho is modular over the totally real field f plus inside f. And so you don't show it's modular, but you show at least it's potentially modular for a Hilbert modular form. And you can still deduce for Hilbert modular forms that it's odd. But then you can then apply Kisson's theorem. OK. All right. So in fact, this is exactly the strategy the strategy one may apply uh, if w is ordinary. So what's ordinary mean? Well, it's a condition that implies Durham, but it's a much more specific uh, requirement on the local representation. And in fact, as a recent, recent paper updated to the archive last night, or from the archive last night, of, uh, of Barnett Lamb, uh, G, and Garrity, and Taylor, that, in fact, will allow you to show that if you have an ordinary representation, it is potentially modular. And even more generally, you would even get the same result. Also, for example, true if W uh, is crystalline in the fontaine fire range. OK. All right. But the methods of this paper aren't really sufficient to give you modularity or potential modularity for all three-dimensional representations. Because in fact, the Durham representation we have here could be very complicated. So I want to say a little bit about how one proves R equals T theorems and something relating to the strategy behind this and show it how it can be also uh, employed in this case. OK. So how do you prove an R equals T theorem? Well, let's start with the old school method. So you have a map from an R to T. And the one thing you have some kind of handle on is the tangent space of R. So this beautiful idea of using auxiliary primes is you can thicken up this ring R into a ring R infinity. And what does thicken up mean? Well, you imagine this to be, uh, I mean, it's a, it has, say, zero relative dimension over Zp, but it may have some very large tangent space. Basically, you increase it without increasing the size of the tangent space. So this, for example, might still be uh, a quotient of a power series ring in a fixed number of variables. On the other hand, you're in a situation with discrete series. So you have lots of automorphic forms. And you can also patch together the automorphic forms. And you get a t. And well, to put it crassly, this shows that r infinity is small. And the fact that there are lots of automorphic forms show that t infinity is big. On the other hand, there's a suggestion here. So, well, this can't be bigger than this. And in fact, what ends up showing is that this has dimension at least the size of this. But anything that's a quotient of this of, will have smaller dimension unless it's an isomorphism. So you get an isomorphism here, and then you deduce an isomorphism here. Okay. 
this is the this is like the minimal case. Here I'm talking. Okay, so that's old school. What's new school? Well, new school is that you still want to thicken up R, but maybe you don't have precise integral information to say something so precise about the integral nature, about the integral structure of R. So maybe you try to say something about uh, the generic fiber of R infinity. And say, for example, uh, here, well, again, this is now a more geometric picture. So let's say you have some geometric space, and let's say it's smooth of dimension n. Then again, all you really need to show, in some sense, is that t infinity, or at least 1 on p, has dimension at least n. And once it has dimension at least n, and it's a quotient of this, it really can't be anything except exactly this. OK. Well, that works sometimes. For example, it works in the ordinary case very nicely, as shown by Garrity. But it doesn't work in general, because what can happen is that instead of even the uh, generic fiber being smooth, it might have a bunch of different components. Okay. So then what can you show? Well, let's just imagine, say, it was equidimensional and it had all these components of dimension n. So what could we deduce, for example, if we knew that t infinity also had dimension n? Well, we certainly couldn't deduce it was an isomorphism. But what we could deduce, for example, that it's at least, well, I'm speaking very roughly here, it at least consists of some union, some non-trivial collection of these components. And so what you might also ask, if you want to try and prove something, is well, what, what do you ask in terms of modularity? You always have to assume rho bar itself is modular. What does that amount to? It amounts to showing that this is non-zero. But more generally, you might ask, not only is this non-zero, but you might ask that, for example, there's a point that lies on each of these components. Or if you're just interested in, say, particular, some particular Gower representation, say you're interested in this guy, then you might not need to know anything else except that there's some automorphic form somewhere else on the same component. So you ask, not only is rho bar modular, but it's modular and uh, the local deformation ring at p, that it lies somehow on the same component. So in other words, you assume, when you take your rho bar, you assume not only does it equal rho bar of some automorphic form, but also uh, that this local representation Say we're just worrying about things at p, which is the most complicated issue. That, for example, you could ask that it lies on the same component of the local deformation ring as rho. Well, you might be a little bit worried in this picture that you know this point is modular. And this lies on this component, but maybe t infinity is this. So you might ask for a more stringent condition that not only is there a modular point on this component, but it's actually a smooth point. So this is just somehow the same component. And smooth point is a uh, right squig arrow, if I worked out the tech source. So you might ask, there's a modular point that is smooth but on the same component. OK. Uh, all right. All right, well, what does that tell us about our particular situation? We have our three-dimensional representation. And it has some very complicated structure. It's not so hard to find, uh, to show that the rho bar is potentially modular, say coming from some ordinary form. But it's very hard to control what component it's going to be on. So now I'd like to sort of mention what the idea behind this paper, which again, it also comes up in a previous paper of uh, G and Garrity, which is the following. Well, there's an idea of Harris that's very nice that says to show a representation rho is potentially modular, it suffices 
to show that rho tensor the induction of some character is potentially modular. I, this is modular. Uh, well, I mean, a little bit sloppy here, but what's the basic reason? Well, the basic reason is, uh, I mean, this is also somehow the same as just restricting this and tensoring with theta and then taking uh, an induction here. And so, for example, if you have some, uh, well, I mean, the idea is tensoring with characters is something you can strip out of. So if you know somehow that rho tensor this character is module, then you can strip the character out, for example, if it's uh, induced from, say, a solvable extension. OK. And so uh, the basic idea that BLGDT uses in this paper is the following. You have your representation rho. And what you can do is uh, you can find, and let's just say that it's, a, it's for example, fun to handle phi, or it has some special, uh, special property. Then you can find the induction of a character such that these two guys lie on the same component, which is exactly what you wanted to play this modularity statement. But of course, you don't just need a modular point on the same component. It has to be corresponds to the same r infinity. And this is induction. So certainly, the reduction of this mod p might not look anything like the reduction of this mod p. This might have a non-solvable image, for example. This has solvable issue. So what you do is you find an ordinary, say, an ordinary automorphic form pi, such that rho pi it bar is equal to rho bar. And then you find another character theta prime, such that this is ordinary, but such that these are the same mod p, and these are the same mod p, and these are on the same component, and these are on the same component. Uh, so you have kind of what you want, but for kind of inconsistent pairs. But that's all right, because now you can tensor them together. And if you look at the representation rho, tensor the induction of theta prime, and rho pi, tensor the induction of theta, just because you know enough about the ordinary component, you can deduce that these two guys both live on the same component. On the other hand, since rho bar is equal to rho pi bar, and in theta bar is equal to int theta prime bar, that they're both the same mod p. They both lie in the same components. You deduce the potential modularity of the left-hand side, and therefore of rho. So that's the strategy they use. Hopefully, I'll explain too badly. But again, there's a little bit of a stumbling block here, is that to do this, you need to be able to find the induction of some character that is locally lying on the same component. And that's actually a restriction. I mean, things that are in the induction of the character tend to be potentially crystalline, just because they're potentially abelian. And so particularly, you don't get things with interesting op uh, actions of the <coughs> monodromy operator n. And so you don't, get you don't really get uh, semi-stable things that aren't crystalline. And so that certainly doesn't apply to everything. All right. So what's the game? Well, you might say, well, can we replace the induction of a character by something else? And uh, I mean, can you try to play this game with something else that you know is modular, but you know lies on the same component? OK. So well, here's the following theorem is that, so here we have my representation here to uh, OE theorem. Given this, there exists a classical modular form from GQ to GL2OE such that rho 
and row f lie on the same components of the local deformation onion. So they certainly won't correspond to the same r, r infinity because row bars will certainly not be the same because this will be odd and this will be even, but at least locally they look similar. So in fact, you have something slightly stronger. You have row f and row. We don't just have they're in the same component. You don't even just have that one's a smooth point, but you actually have slightly better. You have a what I call zap. <laughs> it's a very smooth point. So in other words, the squiggle is preserved on the passage to any finite extension. Uh, except I'm lying a little bit. First, you have to replace q by f, where p uh, is totally split in f. Uh, and you also have to assume that rho bar restricted to the decomposition group at p is not a twist of epsilon 0 star 1. So somehow the result of Kisson is not just being applied in the odd case, but even the result of Kisson is being applied to construct this form f. OK. So, uh, yes. So that's a theorem. Uh, I mean, I could put an easier theorem, which already is not immediately obvious, is that there exists a, modular, a Hilbert modular form f such that rho bar f and rho bar are the same on decomposition groups. So don't just ask that globally they're on the same component, even just ask that they're the same mod p. So in other words, just write down a representation, two-dimensional representation of the decomposition group, and ask, does that come from a modular form? Well, it seems like you can just write them down, but you have to worry a little bit about them, because there's certainly infinitely many of them. Here we have to worry about Frobenius as well. It's not just what's happening on inertia. And let me finally put here easiest theorem is don't ask for a modular form, Hilbert modular form, just even ask that there exists an odd Gower representation of f bar on f to GL2 fp that looks like rho bar. So if you think about this problem, well, then it almost looks a little bit like uh, an inverse Gower problem. You're asking for a Gower representation of GL2 f p or fp bar that looks locally like rho bar is. Okay. So if you try to replace f here by q, it becomes a little tricky. But if you restrict to, if you allow yourself a field which p is totally split, then you can prove that you can prove this. And then you can sort of go backwards and prove these results. All right. Yes. Well, I mean, no, I mean, in, in, in the paper, they prove, they prove this in the fontaine le Fay range, but I don't think it's even obvious. Well, it's certainly not obvious. I don't know if you suspect it's true for, say, all crystalline representations. Well, I don't know. For, I mean, you're, like, very simple. You know, GL2. Uh, well, it's for, it's for GL3, well, right? GL3, yeah. I, I mean, I don't. Right. I mean, somehow, these semi-stable deformation rings, that especially for the potentially semi-stable, you have like tough to pass on hugely ramified extension. They're going to be very complicated. OK. All right. Ooh. All right. All right, so. So this is what we can do. We can try and do exactly the same thing. We start with our, our row. And well, our two-dimensional representation, we can have something locally corresponding to the Hilbert modular form that lies on the same component. And if we choose it carefully enough, when we take our three-dimensional representation, we can show that lies in the same component of sim squared of rho f. The f is now a Hilbert modular form. OK, so these are on the same components. OK, so now we play the same game. We're on the same component, but mod p, everything is, is uh, 
screwed up. So what can we do mod p? Well, mod p, well, we certainly can't find a Hilbert module form or something over a totally real field, because this is even. But we can find potentially a left here, a, a row pi, where pi is now, uh, well, it's going to be a conjugate self-dual representation for GL3 over f, where f is now a CM field. So when I say these are the same mod p, they're the same mod p after restriction to this field here. Moreover, you can also insist that this is ordinary. OK, so now we have something ordinary. So now we want to put something here that's ordinary and uh, looks the same as this mod p. And in fact, we can do this. We can even do it with sim squared rho g for a Hilbert modular form g. Again, each of, the, each of these steps, of course, we're passing to bigger and bigger extensions. OK, so we can play the same game as in g Garrity or in BLGG T, but there's a problem. I mean, the whole point in this method of just working with induction of characters was that once you had modularity of the tensor, you could get rid of the induction and say something about here. I mean, what we're going to have here, we're going to take a three-dimensional representation and tensor it together with sim squared rho g, and we'll be comparing this with sim squared rho f to rho f. So this will be defined, I mean, this is now over some really big CM field f. So again, if we choose things appropriately, we can deduce that this is potentially modular, in other words, modular. And these are the same mod p. And they lie in the same component. And so then, again, in BLGGT, you can deduce that this nine-dimensional representation is modular. So this is now for GL9 over this CM field f. On the other hand, this is a representation of q. This is a representation of, this is a Hilbert module form. So this is a representation of a sum totally real field. So in fact, this is invariant by complex conjugation of f over its uh, totally real field f plus. So using base change, because f of f plus is solvable, what we end up with is that, so this is again, this is, remember, it's just sim squared, tensor sim squared rho g of our Hilbert modular form is modular for some GL9 over f plus. So f plus is now real, or totally real. OK. So if you had functurality going for you in every respect, you could somehow extract this from this term and deduce this was modular, and then go back and before. But one doesn't. On the other hand, you can look and see what happens to complex conjugation. So complex conjugation here, well, here it's trivial. And here, well, because this is coming from a Hilbert modular form, this is minus 1, 1, minus 1. So if you look at complex conjugation on this representation, you'll see that its trace is equal to minus 3. Okay. But if this is really coming from some regular motive of dimension 9, then the trace of complex conjugation should be plus or minus 1. OK, well, these representations are sometimes constructed from motives, but in the weak sense. So there's missing the epsilon, which is the Tate conjecture and, uh, and growth nick Sair conjecture. But in fact, I looked Richard Taylor in a room and said he couldn't come out until he proved the following theorem, which is if pi is regular algebraic, essentially self-dual conjugate for GL uh, n over f plus, and if rho pi uh, is irreducible, and n is odd, then the trace of rho of complex conjugation is actually plus or minus 1. And if you try to imagine how to prove such a thing, I mean, in a good enough situation, you do genuinely have something close to a motive. 
except it's really defined over a quadratic extension. So you just prove the take conjecture by hands by explicitly constructing uh, the cycle that allows you to descend. OK. And so then we're done. OK. All right. So I just wanted to mention one corollary. which is the following. So now I'm going to take rho bar to be a representation of GQ to GL2 FP bar. And there's a version of this where Q is a totally real field in which P splits, but let's just write it this way. And let's suppose again that the image of rho bar contains SL2 FP and P is bigger than 7. And two, let's assume that if you restrict rho to an inertia group, then uh, it has big image. So it looks like this. And let me even say that this generates uh, PGL, well, the Borel in uh, PGL2. Uh, well, rather, this intersect, well, I'll, I'll say this. So in other words, it's quite big. So if you imagine, for example, uh, and also it's not that rho restricted to dp is not the signal atomic character at 0 star 1. And finally, rho is uh, uh, even. Okay. So this last condition here implies that every lift of rho bar, which is Durham and has distinct Hodge Tate weights, uh, is modular and therefore odd and therefore doesn't exist. So this has no lifts which are Durham uh, with distinct Hodge Tate weights. But in fact, the image of this is so big such that it doesn't have any lifts at all for which the image of inertia is finite. So in fact, it also doesn't have any lifts that are. Uh, which inertia has finite image, or in other words, it doesn't have any Durham lifts of uh, the same Hodge Tate weight. So if you look at the space, the global deformation ring of Mesa, then inside here, you have the geometric points, maybe sub, in other words, the ones that are Durham. And so what you see is that this is empty. But on the other hand, this can certainly be non-empty. Ramakrishna showed that you could find lifts to characteristic zero. So you really see an explicit, I mean, of course, you would expect this, but you really see that, um, that the deformation ring is not detected by geometric representations. I, in fact, you're joking, but I, so the, uh, the inverse Galois problem for, uh, for PSL2 F11 is solved, and you can find an even representation, which through some annoying effort I showed satisfied these conditions. Yes. No, exactly. Like, ha. All right. I, I had to finish early because we have cocktails, and that would be terrible to show. All right.